Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and welcome to the Eddie Network podcast. My guest today is Cliff Kimber. I hope that pr I pronounced that right. That's right. Excellent. Don't always get it right. And we are meeting for the first time. We have a, a mutual friend, David Ross. David, uh, I interviewed David uh, a week or two ago, and he thought that Cliff and I should know each other. Um, and, and my conversation with David is not posted as of this moment, but uh, it will. It was so significant. We're going to turn it into two two podcast episodes because we went on so long. So that's the kind of people that we're the kind of people David is connecting. And uh, so, Cliff, thanks for being on the show and tell us a thanks. little about yourself and what you do. Well, thanks for having me, Ed. Um, and just uh, uh, in, in case it makes our on to air, thanks to David for introducing us. Um, so I'm just, I'm a coach and I spend my time with people who invariably think about how do I get better at? Nobody ever hired a coach to get worse at something, right? Right. So I'm kind of one of those people that I spend a lot of my time. Right. I'm one of those people that just helps people think maybe a little bit differently about what it is they're trying to think about. And that's where I spend all of my time. And I, to be honest, Ed, I think the trick for people to want to think clearly is knowing what they want to think clearly about. And a lot of people don't. So that's how I spend my time. Um, that That's uh, what I kind of do. Who do I be? I'm a dad. I'm a, uh, I'm a, uh, a husband. I'm a son. I'm a brother. Uh, and I love being by the ocean. That's That's fantastic. Well, so you know who I am, mm -hmm. I'm a leadership guy, uh, and have been at this in one form or another since the mid-1980s, uh, started my career as a Presbyterian minister, discovered that I wasn't well suited to parish ministry because I was too change-oriented, <laughs> Okay, and that's probably why I never worked, you know, I never was an employee of a corporation either, I mean, corporations churches you know they're all alike you know and they're they're all like they're all dominated by their structure and not by their values and their relationships so that kind of gives you the secret to to my understanding of of leadership which is a, it's really a human function rather than a role or a title and uh, so uh, i was married for 30 years no longer married had three kids they're all married one has a has a, a child now so i'm a grandfather Congratulations. Thank you. And um, my, I, if there's any aspect of leadership beyond seeing it in, in a totally different light than the 20th century did, it is that I'm, I'm extraordinarily focused on change and not change as this kind of abstraction that, you know, so many uh, people like to talk about, but rather as this transition that's constantly ongoing in our lives and in our world and that sort of thing. And and so when we logged on and I looked at your little diagram up there on the wall, yeah, yeah. explained to me what I saw there, okay, that's a that's a picture of transition. Yep. And um and that transition is like like a like a wavelength, you know, energy wavelength. It's going back and forth all the time. But it, it it's also this is my other metaphor for it. It's also like a tumbleweed. If you've ever been in the U.S., the, the desert of the U.S. West, these these tumbleweed plants, you know, the wind blows and they break off and they roll. And and the, ro the tumbleweed is just a bunch of, it's nothing very pretty, but it's rolling uh, and it's rolling over and over and over again. So that's that's an experience that we have, kind of all this cyclical stuff, but it's also moving in a constant direction sort of um sort of like heisenberg uncertainty of wave and and, <laughs> particle. and particle yeah yeah so it's you see but i think that's the dynamic of the live life we live and explains and that di the difficulty of understanding explains why the people you're talking about um are not clear in their thinking uh i, th I think the tumble tumbleweed is is a good analogy um because it moves in it, it spins on its axis while it's also spinning forwards 
um but in spinning forwards it's not really doing anything uh, and it, it's just going into the future i think that the um opportunity for uh us as people that facilitate and work with and coach uh leaders is just to to understand how people are projecting themselves into the future uh because sometimes it's um sometimes it's from the from their own center sometimes it's from the center of an organization sometimes it's something else that they're they're anchored to and the opportunity for us i think is just to check with them where where are you anchored to where where are you coming from how are you how are you going to enable the people that work with you and so the, one of the things you said just before is church and organizations i'm in the process of finishing a book i hope um we're about halfway through it and the the three institutions that i'm thinking about in a particular part of the book is church state and commerce and it, it's quite interesting because uh, if you go back in history not too far the biggest buildings in the area were the churches mm -hmm. and then uh, the buildings of mammon uh, arise and they're much much bigger mm -hmm. and so people can see the power shift from from church commerce and then especially in the uk as well i think the buildings of state get left somewhere in the middle architecturally mm -hmm. so they don't have enough money to be like some of the big organizations the professional consulting firms and they're not quite as uh, geographically well positioned as many churches and buildings of religious and and it's just uh, as as an orientation point it's quite interesting to see how people also enter those buildings and how they feel on entering those buildings and to your earlier point i think that how do i feel within the organizational structure um and how do i feel within the church structure or how do i feel within when i walk into city hall or whatever it is those buildings are uh, are built to let me know what my place is in life what, what my station is Oh, ab absolutely. They're images that represent an idea that is intended to uh, fix the individual in some kind of social context, I think. I mean, you know, a thousand years ago when all the big cathedrals were being built there in Europe, you know, the, the vast majority of people were illiterate. And so the, the the bigness of the thing was all a sign of this is who God is. I mean, they were pointing to God as this big transcendent thing, and we're looking up to into those vaulted ceilings, you know, as a way of of projecting ourselves up into the into the heavens. I mean, it's um, you know cynical. You you could say, well, that's very manipulative, but uh, on another level, this communicated an idea which which did become an anchor for them and in their lives. And, and it's and it's quite interesting as well because uh, I think that if you look at the the big um, the big buildings of uh, an organization like KPMG or Deloitte, you go into the atrium, and the atrium always draws your attention up. And yeah. the architecture is uh, structurally uh, different, but it has the same intent. It's you're you're in the presence of something bigger. So, so here's the question I have for you, and and I and I think this is a question of transition. So these buildings were built at a particular time in human history. Yeah. Now we're we're transitioning into something else, and those buildings no longer represent that. They're empty, and many of them are empty. They, they sent the people home during COVID, so they're they're empty. So, what does that mean for? uh the sim symbolism of those buildings that they're empty well i think there's a couple of things they're a static representation of the brand so and, yeah. and that, that can't be taken away from from the organization so <clears throat> number one new street square which is the the headquarters of deloitte in the uk is a magnificent building and won all sorts of prizes for all sorts of things um and it, and it can't be taken down it's it's there and it it represents Deloitte whether it's utilized the way it was intended to be utilized is a completely different thing as an aside I was talking to somebody uh on a zoom call the other day 
And they said, oh, I've got, a, I've got an offsite that I'm going to. I said, fantastic, where is it? They said, I'm going to the office. And they've been going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I love yeah, that. they've become so entrenched in working at home that the, the offsite is going to be, I'm going into the office. And I think that the, um, and it's funny because David Ross and I have talked often about this in in terms of, you, you remember that phrase, Ed, that was around for a long, the great resignation. And I, I kind of never bought that. What it, what it seemed to me was it was the great reorientation and further, it was the great existential reorientation because people, both leaders and uh, people that worked with them for them had to reorientate around. So if I'm not in the office, where am I? And you had all those questions about productivity, all the, the silliness around, well, can I trust my people and all that stuff? But that that wasn't the, the main issue. The main issue was how am I going to reorientate this, to your point, this world where this static representation of my brand or who I am or my identity or whatever it is um, no longer has the function that it was designed for. And that was really interesting to watch. Just and still is, I think, while, they, while all over the world people try and work that out. So are you working at home or are you working in an office park? I, I work in my, I, I love my home. I, I, I work at home. Yeah. Um, and if if a client really wants me to go somewhere, I'll go. Um, but I, the, the last three years has been, so I've been doing what I do for 20 years. Um, the last three years has been really, since COVID, really interesting. Um in as much as the my job, I think my job as a coach is to is to get out of the client's way and let them think uh, about the things they need to think about, and the last thing they need me as, as a coach is in their way. So how can I facilitate that? And in some ways, I think the screen has enabled that a little bit more, rather than you go into a meeting room, a 12 by 12 meeting room and you grab a cup of coffee and they grab a cup of coffee and you sit down and how you been and all that sort of stuff. Whereas you come onto a Zoom call and people are normally more prepared for the Zoom call, that, especially if they're working from home too. Yeah. And uh, when I did my master's back in 2005, I was really lucky. Um, I did the first master's degree in the UK on coaching and development. And we had... John Whitmore was um, was one of the key, the pre principal um, lecturers and his wife, Diana Whitmore. But it, it was really interesting. And my master's dissertation ended up on being, um, it, the subtitle was, why don't they get out of the box? But it was about perceptions of purchases of coaching towards coaching in the natural environment. Ah. And, it, and I thought it was going to be, I, I thought I was going to do great things and uh, we were going to have conversations with the people I interviewed about you know, walk and talk in nature and what that unlocks. And it ended up being about risk assessment. It was the, the time cost and psychosocial implication of me going coaching with one of their, their employees in the natural environment. So um, the psychosocial bit was, well, if I employ this guy to work with this person and they're walking or out on the lake or whatever it is, what will, what will other people think of me? Uh, and then the time, it was time away from task. All, all that stuff got all mixed up. So, yeah, it ended up being about risk assessment. I, I found the same doing a consulting practice for almost 20 years. So, yeah, I think that's... And the risk is not, it's not actually not whether we fail. The risk is whether I lose control. Yeah. In a sense. But, uh, and then you would ask, well, what are you losing control of, right? Perception. <laughs> and perception informs reality and language informs reality. And there you are, you're, you're kind of back in this, how do you construe the world type thing is uh, I'm a great fan of George Kelly. George Kelly was the, the father of personal construct theory. Um, and just the idea that we make these constructs 
in our heads and, our, and to your point around transition, the constructs are ever evolving. They're kind of open-ended. And I find it really interesting. So uh, how are you working differently now? I mean, you said some of that, but what, what else are you doing? Uh, and, and what and what is working? And maybe that's the better question. What works now as a coach? Or is it the same thing it's always been? No, I, I, <laughs> what's working? Excuse me. I think um, the, the opportunity for people to engage from their home rather from, than from the 12 by 12 meeting room it seems to make a difference on some days, some days not. Uh, and I think that's, that's easier for people. Uh, from my perspective, what am I doing differently? I think probably in the last three or four years, I'm much more relaxed about um, about how I present. And I think that's that's probably a product of a couple of things, right? It's, I'm in my 60s. I'm thinking to myself, well, uh, I was talking to somebody. I bumped into somebody the other day, and I, I was in a pair of shorts, and I said, I've got to go. Uh, I'm going to go, and I've got a coaching session. And they said, do you, do you need to get changed? Are you going to get a, a shirt and tie on? And, I, and it, it was kind of a glib answer, but it was also the truth. is that They don't pay me for my sartorial elegance, right? They They pay me to just turn up, be present, enable them to be in flow, if that's possible, and, and to help them do good work. And it kind of doesn't matter what I'm wearing. And I think, whereas before, when I was when I was up in London, and I, you know, I had a club in Mayfair that I used to go and stay two or three days a week, and I'd go and see all my clients, and you'd be suited and booted. And there was kind of a formality to there was expected this this formal presentation of yourself was expected um and and i think my idea of self-concept and self-presentation and selfhood has changed probably in the last three or four years is that need to say dress appropriately whatever that may mean is that to demonstrate that you understand the code of the tribe oh yeah <laughs> no, no, no doubt <laughs> no, no and, doubt and did covid the pandemic um uh, begin to break that code up so I, that well, uh, break the code up because now they don't see each other uh in person as much as they see each other on the screen and and in some in, you know it's it's interesting doing all these videos. I mean, you're the 76th person I've interviewed this year. Yeah, I watched some of them. And what what people put behind them, some of them are virtual, some of them are some of us just like you where you are. Um that has as much to do now with who they are as putting on a coat and tie. And uh yeah. So which which tribe do you belong to? Um, where are you in, in the hierarchy of that tribe? Because you can, you can walk through an organization and you can just tell by somebody's tailoring where, where they are in the organization, right? You know, it's the 4,000 Armani suit or is it the 400 pounds Marks and Spencer suit? Neither of which is uh, an indicator of whether they're good at their job, right? It's just... <laughs> I assume you you know who Jordan Peterson is. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, you know, early on when he, I think it was during he was publicizing his first book, 12, 12 Rules for Life or whatever it is. And he was saying that what you should do is you should dress up to whatever group that you're doing. So you, you walk in and you're the the most, um, you know, uh, sartorially splendid person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and he he really does that. He spends a lot of money on on clothes, and and I and I always wondered about that because I I had I was a part of a, an event probably fifteen years ago, and it was a community event, 
and we had an outside speaker come in and he was in a, probably a ten thousand dollar suit he was immaculate and and it was really clear that he was sending two messages one that i'm a success and i am um uh and um i am uh, cannot be defeated and um and he was good i mean he's good what he did his speech was great but it was like this guy is has no concept of who he's actually talking to and okay. um that that lack of i would call it lack of situational awareness is a reflection of his own self-awareness and 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 you know ego and how great am i and um but then uh, did you pay him a fee he actually came for free so that's so that's that's quite interesting that you know he came for free and he still turned up suited and booted the way he did and uh, he's still sending that message and it kind of sounds like there's a disconnect in there somewhere right oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> yeah and um the, one of the one of the one of the people that came to hear him speak i was there too um went up to him afterwards and started talking to him about her how she wanted to be a, a public speaker she wanted yeah. to know and, and and he encouraged her to to follow that passion he does but he doesn't know who she is i ended up working for her and she hired me to see if her her staff could run her business while she took a year off to become a public speaker to write a book and the funny thing is we never finished the project she and uh it's it was such a strange experience so you know it's it's like um a lot of missed misdirection a lot of people not really really connecting in the right way and um you know and that that becomes a problem i think for a lot of people because they they take this sense of who they are who they want to be and they follow that and it doesn't really go anywhere and i know this is i know you see this in coaching often i see it in in uh, businesses too and so i guess where i'm leading is how do, how do people actually come to have a clear sense of who they are so that then if we're if we're looking at your little diagram up there and we're at yeah, yeah. the present moment how they move into the future so that 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 sense of their of who they are right now can be consistently maintained into the future and allowed to be developed but but could still be the same person how, how does that happen in your mind so i i have a a flow that I often talk to, to people about, and it would say, look, clarity, simplicity, consistency, constancy, meaningful, significant. So yeah. clarity, do you have clarity about, and you know, you use this in consulting as well as, as coaching, but do you have clarity about what it is you're trying to do, who you are, uh, who you're trying to work with, who you're trying to collaborate with? Yes, you do. Cool. Okay. Have you broken it down into simple enough steps so that you can follow it, they can follow it, you know where you're going, you know what time you need to be there. Um, are you consistent in the way you apply yourself? So clarity, simplicity, consistency, constancy. Do you have those those uh, constant check-ins with yourself, with whomever, with other? It doesn't really matter. Um, is it meaningful? Is the work that you're doing meaningful to you? And I, I'm not a great believer in you need to know your purpose in life. Uh, I think if you can be purposeful in what you do, that'll that'll help you on your journey. So is it meaningful? And then you have the spike, which is significance. So clarity, simplicity, consistency, constancy, meaningful, because everything we want to do is meaningful. And then every now and then you have the spike that that's significant. And did you capture that? And if you captured that, can you replicate it? And do you need to replicate it? And all behavior is an experiment or everything we do for the first time is an experiment. So when that spike happened of significance, did you capture it? Mm -hmm. And can you replicate it? And can you use it again? And if you if it needs to be iterative, how, how are you going to go through that iterative process? And I think that that flow is as simple as I've got it for people that want to 
just kind of nudge into the future sometimes. Sometimes they want to go full speed, but you know. Yeah. But how do I nudge into the future? And I think they're they're the keys. And I've and I've used that with I've got one client who's um his FY target for the, for this year is two billion dollars. And I've got somebody that I speak to who's a head coach in sport. And you give that flow to both of them. And they'll construe it the way they need to construe it. They'll they'll use it the way they need to use it, which is fantastic. But that's a I think if that answers your question, that's as simple as I've as I've got it. Yeah, that does. I, and I like that that um, kind of linear progression because, um, and it's probably much more like your little diagram, which is more like a, a set of it's like more like a pretzel. It, it keeps, <laughs> You're doing so, it, it. You keep feeding back on itself and 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 moving forward at the same time. So the the idea is that this is the infinity loop, obviously. Yeah. And you spin through the infinity loop all the time. You stay where that little silver dot is in the middle, because that's the eternal now. Because you you can't do anything about yesterday; it happened, and you can't take any action tomorrow because it's not here yet. So you have to be in the now. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't stop you looking forwards. So, you know, what if, what's next, the external, what's your vision? Um, and if you get into the future, does your vision work there? Uh, and then if you've got clarity of goals, you can bring back what your next step is. So I'm not, I, for a coach, strangely, I'm not big on goal setting. I think that if I can work with somebody on what's your direction of travel, and if they have clarity around that, the goals are going to drop out. And that's for me. That's a, that's a blessing, right? Because they they kind of they sort it for themselves really, really quickly. This is my direction to travel. So then we can go back into the past, remembering and doing and reflecting on what have we done, what past experiments have we done, and how did you validate them, and can can they be an iterative process? And so that's what you spin through as you're moving through time. So you can see the movement through time, the flow up there, questions from the past, questions from the future, and how do you stay present in the unfolding moment? So I like that. Yeah. You know, it, oh, my reaction to that is that this is representative of a shift in philosophy that's taking place where so, from the static nature of being to the dynamic nature of becoming. And um, I've interviewed people who this is, you know, part of their their language part of the work that they do they, there's there's talking about always in this state of becoming which means that nothing is ever fixed nothing is ever set um and i i like that a lot and then it what the what it does to goals and purpose is it projects it much further out into the future than okay i have a goal to get to friday well that'll be tomorrow so my goals my, that's not a goal that's just that's just a milestone you're setting. Like I have a goal for my work. You know, I, I do, and uh, in my circle of impact model, um, yeah, yeah. it's based on a, a simple idea of leadership, which is all leadership begins with personal initiative to create impact that makes a difference that matters. Yep. So that's my purpose. My purpose is to take that model and apply it in local communities, strengthen organizations of all types and families, and that's really, that's my purpose. But my goal is much different. My goal is is to see one percent of the world's population taking personal initiative to create impact in their local communities. And I've been asked, "Well, how are you going to do that?" I says, "I'm not. It's just <laughs> my goal. I, I, there's no. I don't have any idea how I'm going to do do that. And I don't really want to know how to do that because then I'm in control of that. I want to. I want to seed the world with that idea, and see what happens." And then, and I've released that goal. It's my goal, but it's I've released it, and I, I feel no accountability for it. I guess is a way to say it. So that the your one percent of the world's population, you know, making an impact with in their community without you controlling it. That's um, that's your direction of travel. Yeah, and if you share that. Uh, uh, as a an enabler yeah 
I've got this model and I, this is what I think you could do with it. Go, why don't you go and play? Well, thank you very much. I'll take your model. And as soon as they take the model, something else is happening, right? Because from your, the model is, is being, and they, they start their becoming by taking the model. And I think that that's the, the really interesting thing. Margaret, uh, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with the work of a, a woman called Margaret Heffernan. Um, one of the most uh, watched TED Talks of all time, I think, was, was hers, Willful Blindness. But she wrote a book called uh, Uncharted, Mapping the Future Together. Just fantastic. And, and I'll paraphrase the story because uh, in the book, it's, it's told really, really well. But not far from where I live, uh, th there was a TV producer working for the BBC who wanted to make uh, a, a documentary about plastic and um, recycling. And they made the documentary and the documentary aired and nothing happened. Zero happened. So this, uh, she lives in a small village. And so she went, she knew the butcher and she went down to the butcher and she said, look, this is what I'm really interested in. I mean, sustainability and no more plastic. And why don't you stop using plastic and use uh, something else? And he said, okay. And, they, and he, he eventually she went to every shop. So the whole village became plastic free, plastic bag free. And media descended on this village to understand what had happened. Yeah. So make a documentary about it, nothing happens. Take some action. But I think the documentary was a goal in her direction of travel. And, and I would say, uh, extrapolating from that, that the secret to the secret was that she went and made it personal between her and someone else. Absolutely. And so this week I, I was uh, doing tra conducting training for a group of coordinators from 25 countries in Africa, and they work in rural economic development. And so I'm answering questions, and you know they say, well, how do we? I mean, I'm, and I'm using the circle of impact model. So they said, well, how do we? Um, how do we communicate this model to the leaders of communities? And I said, well, that, you know, you're, you're looking for a hack, a leadership hack. There's no technique for this. <laughs> what you have to do is you have to live it. You have to decide that the, you have to decide what your values are and what your purpose is and go find people who share that with you. And then together create a vision for impact where you then say, okay, what kind of structure do we need to fulfill this, this vision? And it was like freeing them. It was like, oh, so we can just be ourselves and we go out and build relationships. We're, we're networking. This is kind of the key of networking is you're not just connecting. You're not just collecting more names in your, in your database. You're actually establishing a relationship with someone where the two of you together are creating some kind of synergy that has an impact upon the situations you're in. And, yeah, and to our, and I can't remember if it's before we started recording or not, but it's that networking thing is if I take it from the perspective of not what's in it for me, but how do I add value? Oh yeah. How do I add value? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, David said to me, there's this guy, Ed, and I think you'd really get a lot from him. And I think maybe you could contribute something. And I was like, okay, fantastic. And, uh, so I watched some of your, your previous podcasts and think, oh, that's really interesting. And then I, I'm thinking, well, how do I add value? And the, the best way for me to add value is just turn up and be me, right? And right. If, if you can take some value from that, that's fantastic. But I think that the, the, the whole networking movement is if you just come from the perspective of how do I add value? The other thing about networking that I think is really, really important is you never know when you're in a networking situation. You never, and I've, my daughter's 20, 23, and um, I've said this, uh, she's got me as a dad. So, you know, we've spent 20 years on and off thinking about performance and, <laughs> and what does that look like? And yeah, you've been there, right? So, you know, you know what it's like. And uh, I've been saying to her, you, you never know when you're in a networking situation and stuff will emerge and you add value and all that good stuff. And she's she's in a conversation with a bunch of friends who 
introducing her to more friends and they say well this is Maddie and <clears throat> she's just finished a master's in sports psychology and that's it's fantastic and there's a guy sitting in the group who uh, works for a football club and he works specifically with the young young people 16 to 18 year olds and he said that would be really interesting for you to come and have some conversations with us if, she, if she'd have gone into that circle of friends knowing that he was going to be there she wouldn't have presented it in in the way she did she right. might have built rapport she might have tried too hard whereas the networking situation she could add value and it was it was lovely to have her come back and tell that story right well the, <laughs> so what you're really saying is that we're always networking but we're not networking in the old manner but we're just we're just building relationships where something of value can happen i, I was at a meeting of a group here in Wilkes County, uh, North Carolina last night. And it's a it's a group oriented around people who are starting things who, you know, they, they have small businesses and they're and we were talking about uh, grant writing last night. That's what this is my first time with this group. And I met a, a young woman who is um, uh, who's a, a, a massage therapist. And, and uh, you know, and okay, there are a lot of those out there. And she and she says, "Well, I'm really, I'm really trying to learn a a, a method called Thai massage therapy." And I had never heard of that. And she began to describe a little bit about it. I said, "Hmm." I said, "Go look at some of my videos, and if it intrigues you enough, reach out to me, and I'll invite you on my my podcast so that uh, we can talk about this." And you can tell us what you're learning, because when you tell us what you're learning, we're learning with you. And you, when you can, can articulate what you're learning, then you're le learning even more. It becomes more clear in your own mind. Yeah. So um, this will be this will be interesting to see what whether she follows through on that. And um, she may be the next person I interview after you, which would be the coolest thing in the world to me. Would be, yeah, it would be fantastic. I think that the, there's a couple of things there, Ed, isn't there? Is that, that one, and I can't remember who, who said it, but I don't know what I'm thinking until I write it down. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, uh, and I think about this a lot with people that I work with, is we tell stories twice, once to ourselves and then to someone else. And the the very best stories people will tell on our behalf yeah and i think that that's that clarity simplicity consistency constancy that all that good stuff is if you can articulate that as a story to yourself and then to someone else and it lands with them for whatever reason adds value in some way then they will tell your story for you and uh, uh, the the example I, I always think of is do you remember the movie the sixth sense oh yeah bruce willis film the the, the it was really clever. The marketing of that was really clever because the story they wanted you to tell was don't tell the story. Yeah. And people went out and said, have you seen The Sixth Sense? No, I haven't seen The Sixth Sense. It's fantastic. Well, what happens? Well, I can't tell you. You need to go and see it. It was just... That was brilliant. brilliant. That was brilliant. And, and so you, you're thinking all the time like that. So it would be good if she turns up, if she reaches out. And And the other thing is that when they're telling your story you told them it has become their story and that is that means it's going to have a life that extends beyond you or me and and that to me is the the highest compliment that someone can give to us is that they've owned the story and they've made it their own and they're going to share it with others and um and that's your impact model right the, with the, yeah. the, the 23 countries you were working with the other day <clears throat> and now they have this the storytelling model of, of around impact that they can go and articulate in their way yeah that's great for you because you you let go of control but it's also great for them because they can say well this impact model is really really good but if i add this to this and the way that i tell this story in that place they'll have more impact so they contextualize it they put it in a context which i think is just fantastic right yeah it is so I'm interested in this book you're writing. So tell us a little bit about it. And um... Um, 
So uh all because you pulled all your hair out because of it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now this started to go a long time ago. So um uh I made the brave decision that it was you know when your hair gets thin and wispy, well you don't, but it gets really thin and wispy and yeah. I just one day I said it's gotta go. I can't I can't do it anymore. Um That's great. <laughs> thank you. So um there, there's a, a a theory in positive psychology called flow from Mahai, Chief Sen Mahai. And uh, you will know about it and you will know about it's it's based on uh, challenge and uh, task. And he was a social psychologist and his contribution to uh, positive psychology can't be refuted or underestimated. But my sense is he defined flow too narrowly. Mm -hmm. So the book that I'm writing for Routledge at the moment uh, is called Born to Flow. And my sense is if you take the psychosocial um, model and you, and you think about the biopsychosocial model and then you the two other elements I've laid into that are environmental and tech. So they're the elements that impact your flow. And I think you're flowing all the time to a greater or lesser degree. and you know, it would take as long as the book to to go into it in detail. But if I take someone like the Professor Leroy Littlebear from um, Calgary, uh, who's First Nation leader, but also a quantum physicist, and he talks about surfing the flux and anima and inanima, uh, and you know, I tap the table and it's solid, but at a subatomic level, there's some flow in there, right? There's some. There's oh, yeah. some so if that's true, and if I go back to George Kelly, being the, he, he described the being in motion, the person's in motion, the person as scientist doing your experiments all the time, the first time you do everything, it's, a, it's an experiment. And so if I wake up in the morning and I say, well, okay, where is my flow today? And I'm kind of, you know, a bit sore because I trained hard yesterday or whatever it is. And I'm, I think, well, my flow is maybe a two or three. How can I improve that? Instead of waiting for, for Chicks and Mahais, um outside elements to come together to drag me into flow, what happens if I, I go into flow? Because you often hear people say, I was in the zone. I was just in flow, man. And But you never hear anyone say, well, I'm going to go and get in flow. Well, why not that's that's fascinating um it, it makes me want to wake up every morning and be in flow when i wake awake up wake up so i think i think you're there to a greater or lesser extent i think that it but it might not be your optimal it might not be your optimal flow it might not be those fantastic moments when you lose self-awareness and time slows down or speeds up or that fulfillment level but you might wake up and think well actually i have mo more potential to flow today there is more within me to give so let's work on that let's yeah. let's find some way to increase my flow level so hopefully it'll be finished uh hope is not a strategy for success but i think the, in the in the next two or three months i think it'll be finished well when it's about time for it to come out let's let's talk again yeah, that would be great. That was and, so cool. Sure. So we can get some people to buy it because that's that's important. That that, that would be nice. <laughs> it's quite interesting. I think I learned about, about I learned a lot about that. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I I saw you you were talking about your African um edition uh the other day and one of the podcasts I watched, which was um fantastic to see. Uh, so that is the one up there on the shelf at the top behind you. That's that's the original. The, the oh, new, right, okay. The new one is called. Oh so, wow! Okay, that's fantastic. It, it, I'll that, tell you an interesting story with this. Um, we we spent three years putting this together. I was working with my publisher in Nairobi, and the week before this was to be done, and it's sent off to the publisher. She says. My staff is concerned about the title, which was Circle of Impact Africa. I said, really? You know, that's what the book is about. 
she says, but we don't think of ourselves as Africans. Yeah. We're Kenyans or we're Kikuyus or Maori or what, what not Maori, but um, Maasai. You know, he said, we, we think in national and tribal terms. Really? And, you know, I've been involved with all these people for, for three years at this point, three and a half years. And I didn't have, I had never heard that from any of them. And it. Then I started asking this, is, is, it, is this true? Oh yeah, this is true. Uh, and so I was, I felt so embarrassed because I should have been more sensitive to that, but I wasn't. And um, so, so we changed the title and um, everything's, everything's fine. Uh, it's actually, um, it's copyrighted under a circle of impact Africa. And it'll, it'll probably be published on Amazon for that since it'll go more to American and European audiences. Um, and it, so, but so that's part of that. I think that's part of the flow that sometimes we miss is that we're not flowing with the other people that we're encountering. And and when we when we find ourselves flowing with them, like I was with these these folks in Africa this week, it's it's really magic. It's really um, you know it, it's it's those moments when I begin to tear up and to say this this is why I'm doing this. And I wish I could claim, be able to do this every day, you know. But you see, they have to be in the flow too for us to be together in the flow. <laughs> so, uh, so how how do you how do you best enable that? Is, is the question. Um, and mainly, I think you enable it by um, having humility, yeah. being compassionate, being curious uh you know you got two of these and one of these so it's kind of you know, listen twice as much as you talk i think all of that stuff and then getting out of their way how, how do i how do i you know whether it's 23 african nations or if it's a one-to-one -one ceo or it, it kind of doesn't how do, how do i enable you but get out of your way there's a guy in the in the sports world a, a guy called Sir dave alred um and he he works with all sorts of sports people golfers and and what he worked out was when he was coaching instead of coaching face to face with whether he was working with a golfer or a rugby player or whatever it was he would come and stand alongside them yeah so he could see what they were facing what they were trying to do and not always possible in the executive world or the corporate world but it's a really interesting thing to have in mind, I think, and especially in relation to what you're just saying is enabling someone to stand the flow is, how do I stand beside you? I, I had this experience with a CEO and this was about 15, 16 years ago. He was new at the company following a, a regime that had been very top down, very controlling. And he showed up and he gave no indication of his plans for four months. And then I, I, I came into the picture as to help write a value statement for the company. And what I learned was, his name was Paul, there's electric utility. Paul would um, take breakfast out to the line operations, you know, before those guys went out in their trucks to go work on the power lines. He'd take, and he'd show up in his t-shirt and jeans and they wouldn't talk about work. They'd talk about their families. So they all came to know him as Paul. He knew them by their first names. He knew their spouses. He knew their children. And so by the time we got to the end of our project, which was a three-month long, three month long project, and we had this, um, I'm, circum I'm shortening this thing. So on the last day, we had a choice between five, five statements that the members of the committee had written. And they had made their choice and we had hidden the votes and he had, he came in and he chose the one that they had chosen. It was like people feeling like, oh, we're going to be okay. He's one of us. And I think that's, I still think about that with, um, you know, it, it was a big deal then. It's a bigger deal now in what the way I see things, but it's, there's so much opposition from people and leaders and here he is he's standing he's going to walk beside them and and what and what the what came out of the the values process was a training process for the middle managers to train 
all the lowest echelon of the company in problem solving and communication and, and taking initiative and, and all these things and transform the com company so that in two years they became the most, one of the most trustworthy companies in the, in the country. That's interesting there. I think it was Warren Bennis who said, um, trust is the lubrication of the company or trust is the lubrication. <clears throat> and it, it, if you think about um, trust from the perspective of flow, Yes. I have. But here's the other thing. The, tr trust is, is really, really interesting. Over the last few years with the, the Volkswagen scandal and Enron and World Pay and all, all that other stuff. And then I think it was Peter Drucker who said. Um, it's not possible to win trust. You can only lose it. And, I, and that's kind of contrarian, but you don't take a job not trusting the employer. You don't go and buy a car from a dealer that you don't trust. I have what I see, and and this is my contribution to this thing, is I think before you can have trust, you must have respect. You must respect yourself, but you have to respect that other person because yeah. you trust is a product of respect. And, and then out of that trust, you can build mutual accountability, mutual affirmation, mutual, the mutuality that is needed for a team to work well. So, so I, th I think the essence of that is, and I, I think about it as not from a religious pers perspective, but just from the Martin Buber thing, you know, w without thou, there is no I. Right. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and create some gracious space for you. Uh -huh. And I'm I'm going to enable you to step into that gracious space, but I'm also going to create that gracious space for me, so I can step towards you if that's okay. And I think that's a sign of respect and the willingness to engage. And guess what? Now you can step in if you wish. And by the way, the invitation is come stand in my circle, which is your circle of impact, right? If nobody comes to stand in your circle, no impact. So I, w without I, there is no, no thou. And I think if I can create gracious space and you think about it in terms of your consulting work and the, the people that you work with, and I think about it in terms of my clients and who I work with, the, the worst thing I think you can do is damage your relationship irrevocably. And, you know, I've made that mistake a couple of times. I've, I've done that a couple of times for whatever reason. And uh, that trust will never come back. And that's okay. I've learned from it. I'm a different person. Uh, and, I, and maybe the person on the other side of it was slightly different, but you don't want to make that mistake again. I did a, uh, I'm looking, I'm looking for the episode, but I did a, um, an interview with a young man who lives in Sweden who had written a book called Rel Relational Activity. Okay. And, um, uh, I'm looking for the date so that uh let's go I'll back. find it and he um it's it's an interesting thing because he based this book that he wrote on boober's i thou okay and what was what was interesting was i saw him on uh, i found him on linkedin and the day that i found him on linkedin that morning i was talking with a colleague in in texas who was reading I Thou. Okay. Like, okay, there's some synergy here. I need to be taken. And um, so. Serendipity, right? Serendipity. Serendipity. Or providence or what, whatever it is that causes these things to happen. Well, I, I kind of like the word, I was a big fan of jo Joseph Campbell and, and he, he tells the story of serendipity. And I think seren serendipitous or serendipity was, coined in about 1742 by Horace Walpole. And uh, Serendip was the name for uh, Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. And it was, it was on the Silk Road. And so the idea was, you know, all, all of the worldly goods and everything you could ever want passed by these, these people's door. 
And so Warpole came up with this idea of serendipity or being in the right place at the right time, however you want to put it. And I think that it's quite interesting. Uh, and I don't, so I don't, I don't believe in accidents and I don't believe in luck, um, which always raises a few eyebrows. Um, but I think you have time, timing and chance. Yeah. And to that, you add the place of most potential. So if I can put myself in the place of most potential, to come back to that other flow of consistency and constancy, if I can put myself in the place of most potential and my timing is good, and that's cadence and rhythm, and to your point earlier with you know your, your colleagues in Africa, understanding their rhythm, their cadence, what are they working to? Um, so time, timing, chance, if I can understand, put myself in the place of most potential, I'm going to increase my chances of optimal success and people go yeah but <laughs> this i think um, it might. well this has been this has been great cliff i appreciate you coming on um i wish we could go another hour but um you know we've, we've, reached an hour. we've reached an hour and yeah, uh, tempest fugit right yeah, um, yeah, that's that's exactly right. Uh, how how do people find you? And uh, yeah, they can find me on LinkedIn. Um, just Cliff Kimber, uh, and I'm on LinkedIn. Um, the Evolution Partnership, Cliff at EvolutionPartnership.com is. Um, I don't have a website. Uh, it's. I'll get one one day, but it's, <laughs> there are too many other things. That need before doing. you retire, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. I really appreciate the evolution uh, partnership. What is the evolution partnership? Oh, uh, in the UK. And, and what is that? What is that? Is oh, that... Yeah, we're just uh, co so um, coaching and facilitation, and uh, just general ways of thinking about performance. And I work m m with my wife, not uh, necessarily joined at the hip, but she's a nutritionist. So often I'll get clients who are not taking care of themselves. So we'll, I'll, I'll say to Claire, can you talk to this person? And they, they can form a relationship, Chinese walls or whatever. Um, but it's just about how, how do you be the best person you can be? Okay. That's great. But Ed, I really appreciate um, our conversation and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, yeah. And when Born to Flow is... Uh, on the bookshelves, I'll, I'll circle back, right? If not before. Oh, yeah, let's do it before. So thank you, and I wish you well. And, and thank you, everybody, for watching the Eddie Network podcast. And um, make sure to subscribe and like. And if you have a comment, please leave that for us so that we can respond back to you. And, Perfect. So, and thank you again, Cliff. And thank you. And we'll see you next time here on the Eddie Network podcast. Hello, well.